This is going to be an overview for the book of Ephesians. The author is the Apostle Paul. The title, Ephesians, uh, that's because it's he's talking to the natives of Ephesus. And that means desirable ones or fully purposed. The theme is the church, the body of Christ, and how everything that we have we got in Christ. Everything that you have, spiritually speaking, is in Christ. And here is a short outline. Chapters 1 through 3, you got our standing in Christ. That's spiritual. 4 through 6, your state. That's physical. Your standing never changes. Your state changes based on how you're living from any given moment. But let's get into the book, chapter 1. In chapter 1, you're going to see what we get in Christ. What do you get in Christ? In Ephesians 1, 4, it says, According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Notice the phrase, chosen us in him. The ones that are chosen are the ones that chose of their own free will to get in him that is in jesus christ how do you get in christ well ch by choosing of your own free will to believe on him and what he did for you on the cross to be your payment for sin so he chose before the foundation of the world to save anybody that would make that choice of trusting jesus christ to be their savior he didn't choose who would get saved and choose who wouldn't get saved he chose that anybody who gets saved and gets in the Lord, it, he's going to save that person. Anybody who chooses of their own free will to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, then he's going to save that person. The people that don't choose that, you know, that bothers God. That's... It, it's he takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked and it, the bible says that he's not s slack concerning his promises some men can't count slackness but his long suffering toward us we're not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance he wants everybody to be saved he doesn't choose who gets saved and who will not get saved but he chose to save anybody that would choose him in ephesians 1 5 it says having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by jesus christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will i didn't get predestinated until i got saved i've been predestinated unto the adoption uh, this has to do with me getting a new body in romans eight twenty three, it says and not only they but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. When this happens, I'll not only be a son of God, spiritually speaking, but my body will be as well. In Ephesians 1 7, it says, In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. Redemption has to do with buying back. You see, I was alive without the law once, as Paul said, but when I reached what they call the age of accountability, the Lord had to buy me back. He has to redeem me, and he did it with his own blood. In Acts 20, 28, it talks about how, he, how God purchased us with his own blood. In 1 Peter 1, 18 through 19, it says, For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things, as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. He purchased us with his own blood. He bought me back. I was alive without the law once. At one time I was safe. When I was a little child, I had no knowledge of the fact that I had sinned against God. And then one day... I realized I'd sinned against God. I realized my guilt of sin. I reached the age of accountability, and I needed to be bought back. 
Ephesians 1, 8 through 10, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure which he hath purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. The dispensation of the fullness of times is when time ends and eternity begins. And that'll happen after the millennium and the ages of ages, and then it's going to be eternity. And our minds can't really grasp eternity yet. But it says in Ephesians 1.13, In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. You heard the word of truth, you believed, and at that moment the Holy Spirit sealed you. And nothing can break that seal. It says in Ephesians 4.30, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. The devil can't break the seal. You can't break the seal. Your greatest enemy can't break that seal. In Ephesians 1.14, it says, Which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. What's the earnest of our inheritance? The Holy Spirit of promise. The Holy Spirit sealing us is the earnest of our inheritance. You see, God was so serious about saving you that he gave you the Holy Spirit to be like a down payment to show you that he was serious about it. Just like when you bought a house, you gave earnest money to show that you were serious about completing the purchase. Your body is now the house of God. You were bought by a price. Uh, he gave you the Holy Spirit as a down payment. And at the rapture, he is going to remodel your vile body and fashion it like unto his glorious body. In Ephesians 1, 19 through 20, it says, and What is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places? Jesus Christ is my God because he is alive. Most people choose dead gods or gods that are dying. You know, they choose people to be their gods. They don't even realize, well, that person is going to die just like me. They don't even think about that. They idolize that person, look up to that person. But Jesus Christ is my God. He's alive. He can't die. Jesus Christ is sitting up there at the right hand of the Father in heavenly places. And I'm right up there with him, as you'll see in chapter 2. But in Ephesians 1.21, it says, He's far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. Anything you're going through down here is under God's feet. He is above it all. Any ruler, any president, any uh, authority figure, fleshy or spiritual, he is ahead of them all. In Ephesians 1, through 23, it says, And hath put all things under his feet, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Notice how it gives you a definition of what the church is. It is his body. The Bible interprets itself. He's head over all things to the church, which is his body. You see, the church isn't the building you go to on Sunday. And... A lot of people think that. When they think of church, they just think of the, play, the buildings they drive past on the way to work. And they're everywhere. But there's only one church. And it's made up of all born-again believers. I mean, you've got local churches that's um, into, like local assemblies of believers. But there's only one church which is made up of all saved people. Now, chapter 2, it talks about being saved by grace through faith. It talks about how we're reconciled in one body by the cross. In Ephesians 2, 1, it says, And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. You see, quickened, that means to make alive. I was alive without the law once, remember? But when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. Meaning that there was a day when I didn't understand that I had broken God's commands and I sinned against him. But when the day came that I found out that I had sinned against God, I died spiritually speaking. I was dead. I was dead in trespasses and sins, and I needed to be quickened. The moment I believed the gospel, I was quickened. He made me alive. 
Ephesians 2, 2, where in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. When you walk according to this world, you are walking behind the devil. He's the prince of the power of the air. John 12, 31 calls him the prince of this world. He works in the children of disobedience. Not every person, you see, is called a child of God. Some people are a Ch ch children of disobedience. The Bible talks about a child of hell. The, the Bible talks about a children of wrath. You actually don't become a son of God or a child of God until you get saved. Until the day you get saved, your dad is the devil. In John eight forty four, Jesus even tells these people, the Pharisees, he's like, you're of your father the devil. And the lusts of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own for he is a liar and the father of it. So there's some people, the ones that aren't saved, they're ch children of the devil. They're not a child of God. Ephesians 2, 4 through 5. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us made us alive, quickened us together with Christ. By grace, you're saved. You see, everything you got, you got because of the Lord Jesus Christ. You're made alive because of the Lord Jesus Christ. You can be saved because of the Lord Jesus Christ. Even though we were dead in trespasses and sins, Jesus Christ loved us and died on the cross to pay our sin debt. And when you believe the gospel, he quickened you together with Christ. You passed from death to life. Just like Jesus raised up from the dead, and he was then alive, the same thing happened to you when you got saved. And it says in Ephesians 2, 6, And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. I'm so much a part of Jesus Christ that I'm already in heavenly places in him. I'm already there in Jesus. I'm just waiting on my body to be. Just like the song. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Grace is God giving you something that you don't deserve. That is salvation. You're saved by faith plus nothing else. My faith in Jesus Christ and his finished work on the cross is what got me in the family. It's a gift. If I could earn it, then it would be an award. If I could win it, then it would be a prize. If I could buy it, then it would, wouldn't be a gift, would it? He gave it to me for free. So if you can earn it, or win it, or buy it, then it's not actually a gift. So you're getting it absolutely for free. For nothing. It isn't of works. In other words, if it isn't of works, I didn't get it by living right. I didn't get it by being a good person. I don't have it because I am a good person. I don't keep it by being a good person. And when someone sees me doing good, when someone sees me acting like a Christian, that doesn't prove that I have it. You see, I got it, and I have it, and I keep it, and prove it because I have the testimony that I have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, there's a lot of people out there, they say, to be saved, you're going to have to live a good life and do good works, and then maybe... You know, when you get to heaven, God will say, well, you, you did good enough to be saved. Come on in to heaven. You know, that, that happens. Uh, you, what, that's what you hear by a lot of people. That's, if you ask them, like, if, when you ask somebody, what do they think saves a person? That's what comes out of their mouth is complete works-based salvation. Now, there's people that take it the other way. They say, well, you're saved by grace through faith. But then you got to have the works. You got to do good. You got to live right. You, you got to abstain from all these certain sins. So then they add works the other way. They think you got to have good works to keep it. While the other people thought you had, you got to have good works to get it. And then there's other people. They say you're saved by grace through faith. It's not of works. You're kept saved by grace through faith. You can't keep yourself saved by living right. But if you are really saved, then you will do this and this and this and this and this and that. 
And they have their own list of standards and things that that they believe a saved person will actually do. And they go by that list of standards to prove whether a person is saved or whether a person is lost. Once again, you're adding a hint of works in there to salvation. You see, the only thing that proves that I got it and that I'm going to keep it and the only thing that proves it is the testimony that I have. Now, you may not believe my testimony, but I do. And that just goes to show you that the only person that really knows if somebody's saved is that person and God and the devil. The devil knows if you're, you're still truly a child of disobedience or if you're just acting like one. God knows if you're a son of God, and you know if you've been saved. Now, you may have doubts sometimes, but only you can truly know. And so the only thing that's going to show that I got it, and, I'm, and the only thing that shows that you've got salvation, that you're going to keep salvation, and that proves that you have it, is if you have the testimony. If you can say right now that there was a time when you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ to be your crucified, buried, and risen Savior, and you trusted in that, if there was a time when you trusted in that, then that, sh then that, then that means you have salvation. That means you're going to keep salvation because God keeps you saved, and that proves you're saved. And it's all about your testimony of what happened during that moment when you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. It was a transaction that took place. It wasn't a covenant that took place. It was a transaction. I mean, you were literally born. I mean, just like you were born to your mother, and that can't be undid, you were born again, and that can't be undone. So, people may not believe your testimony, but you know. You know what happened that day. So, your works, your good works that you do, and the bad works that you abstain from doing, are a completely separate issue from the salvation itself. Whether that be good and bad works you did before salvation, those things have nothing to do with whether you can get saved. You may think, well, I've lived a horrible life my entire life. There's no way that God will save me. You're wrong. Those bad works have nothing to do with whether you can get saved or not. The good works have nothing to do with whether you can get saved or not. And then after you're saved, you may think, well, I'm doing all these good works, so I've, I've kept my salvation because of them. No, that's a separate issue from the salvation itself. The bad works you've done after salvation, a separate issue from the salvation itself. The good works and bad works you're doing have nothing to do with your salvation. It has to do with your discipleship. You see what I'm trying to say? It has to do with whether you're being a good disciple. It has to do with your walk. Is your walk good? I mean, you, you're, you can be a Christian that's not walking in the Spirit. But the works I did before salvation, good or bad... And the works I did after salvation, good or bad, that's a completely separate issue than the salvation itself. If you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, put your faith in Him and what He did for you on the cross to be your payment for sin, you're saved, what you've done, what you didn't do, that's something you've got to talk to God about to stay in fellowship, but it has nothing to do with your salvation. With that being said, in Ephesians 2.10, the very next verse, it says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. You see, just because good works don't save a person, or keep us saved, or even prove that we're saved, this doesn't mean that we shouldn't do good works. We should do good works. We have the ability to do good works. We have the ability. We can let Jesus Christ work through us, and we, we need to do them. We need to live a good life. We need to live a clean life. We don't need to live like we did before we were saved. You see, when you talk like I just talked a moment ago, 
People say, well, you just think that you can live however you want to. Or they'll say, well, you just like going out and giving the gospel and saying these people are saved and making all these false converts who after you supposedly get them saved, they don't ever darken the door of a church or even change their life. Or, or, and all that. What does that have to do with what the Bible says about a person's salvation? I mean, just because... This random jo these random Joes out here do not uh, live a good life after they're saved or maybe they even make a false profession and don't live right. That has nothing to do with the fact that good works do not prove that you're saved. That's a, that's a shame and a tragedy that, you know, somebody gets saved and then just lives however they want to. That's never good. I've never promoted that i've never acted like i promote that in any way it's just i teach the the stuff that they do after salvation is a separate issue that's between them and the lord and they will be judged for that in the flesh you'll reap what you sow and it has it it's going to affect eternity or at least the millennium because you're not going to have uh crowns and reign and, and inheritance in the millennium because you just lived how you wanted to your whole life so you're going to get to the judgment seat of christ with nothing all your works will be burned up don't ever let anyone tell you that the blood of the lord jesus christ isn't important this is the next thing we'll talk about in ephesians 2 13 but now in christ jesus you who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of christ Hebrews 9.22 And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood there is no remission. You see, Jesus Christ had to die a bloody death on the cross to pay for our sins, and through his blood we are made nigh. We were far off as the enemies of God. Now through his blood we are the sons of God. His blood matters. He had to shed his blood on the cross. In Ephesians 2.14 it says, For he is our peace who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. You see, he is our peace through the blood of Jesus Christ. I got peace with God. In Colossians 1.20 it says, And having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him I say whether there be things in earth or things in heaven. Me and God were enemies, but when the blood was applied it made peace between two enemies between me and God. I got the blood applied to my soul. I'm no longer an enemy of God. I'm a son of God. Ephesians 2, 15 and 16, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity, thereby so we're no longer at enmity with god if when we get saved and that verse proves that the way into the body of christ was made possible when jesus christ died for our sins on the cross it says in that he might reconcile both unto god in one body by the cross now chapter three paul is given the dispensation of the grace of god he has revealed the mystery that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body. In Ephesians 3, 2, it says, If ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you. A dispensation is simply God dispensing something. Here he dispensed grace to Paul. Uh, you probably heard of a soap dispenser. What does a soap dispenser do? It dispenses soap to you. Here God dispensed grace to to Paul and many people get bent out of shape really bad about the word dispensation some people go as far as saying you won't find dispensations in the Bible and they like to give people a hard time who define dispensation as a period of time well the dispensation doesn't mean mean period of time it's it's become kind of like a, a a figure of speech because some dispensations operate under certain periods of time, if you know what I mean. But the fact is that God revealed something to Paul 
that wasn't known until he revealed it to Paul. So that was a, a new dispensation. He dispensed something to Paul that hadn't been dispensed before. And it, it goes on in this chapter talking about what was actually revealed to Paul in Ephesians 3, 3 through 5. It says how that by revelation, you see, he revealed something to Paul. He made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages, you see, in other ages, was not made known unto the sons of men. You see, they didn't know it back, back there, what Paul has revealed to us, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. You see, back in other ages, this wasn't made known, but now it is. And what wasn't made known is the fact that the Gentiles would be fellow heirs and of the same body. You see, they didn't even know about the body of Christ until Paul came along. Now that doesn't I don't I don't believe that Paul was the first person in the body, but I believe that Paul was the one who revealed the fact that when you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ you're put into the body of Christ. And it says in Ephesians three six that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. And when we got in this body we're no longer Jew or Gentile. When I got, in, got into the body of Christ, I'm no longer Jew or... In Galatians 3.28, it says, There's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither bond nor free. There's neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. Now, chapter 4, it talks about unity in the Spirit. It talks about one Lord, one faith, one baptism. And it talks about neither give place to the devil... In Ephesians 4, 4, it says there is one body and one spirit, even as ye are called, and one hope of your calling. So, that the one body. Obviously, that's the body of Christ that's we, that we've been talking about. When you get in Him, in the body, that's where you get all of these things we've been talking about. That's where you get sealed into the day of redemption. That's where you get put in heavenly places in Christ Jesus you know, all these benefits that you have, spiritually speaking, are all because you got in the body. So there's one body and one spirit. Obviously, the one spirit is the Holy Spirit, of course, the one that sealed you into the day of redemption. So there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, it says. So there is one Lord. There's one faith. There's one baptism that saves a person. But think about it like this, too. You see how it says there's one Lord. But yet, in another place in the Bible, in 1 Corinthians 8, 5, it talks about how there's God's many and Lord's many. You say, well, that's a contradiction. No. you got to think about what the context is in chapter 4, about what he's even talking about. You know, there's God's many and Lord's many, but there's one Lord that saves a person. There's one Lord that's the, that's the real thing, you see. Think about one faith. You say, well, there's many faiths. Some people got faith in the Hindu gods or something. Some people got faith in Buddha. Some people got faith in all kinds of stuff. But there's one real faith, one real faith that saves a person. And then you see that one baptism. There's one baptism that saves. And... The only only one baptism can save, and that's the the spirit baptism. The spirit baptism has absolutely nothing to do with water, and it happened the moment you believed the gospel, and at that time you probably didn't even know it that it took place. But see, this baptism is done by the Holy Spirit. It's not a physical baptism that a person can do for you in water, like the Church of Christ would have you think. But what happened was the moment you believed the gospel, the Holy Spirit himself baptized you into the body of Christ, that body we've been talking about. It says in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, for by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. When your pastor baptized you in front of the church in a, in, up there in that bathtub, was that a spirit baptizing you? No, it says for by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. You see, this is a spirit baptism. This is not believer's baptism that you did to 
show everybody as a testimony that you're saved, you see. This is a completely different baptism. You see, and if you show this to a Church of Christ person, they'll say, well, they'll say, well, there's only one baptism, so you can't say this, that that's not water baptism. But yes, you can say that, because as I showed you, it says one Lord, but in 1 Corinthians 8, 5, Paul says there's God's many and Lord's many. This says one faith, but there's obviously more than one faith. This says one baptism, but the Bible talks about other baptisms. So it, there's no contradictions there. It's just that the context is there's one Lord that saves. There's one faith that saves. There's one baptism that saves. All these are the one thing that's like the main thing. You see what I'm saying? And the one baptism is not believer's baptism. Where your pastor baptizes you in in water. That's that's the believer's baptism. That's not the spirit baptism. The spirit baptism is what saves because the spirit baptism is what placed you into the body of Christ. Then he says in Ephesians 4, 6, One God and Father of all, who is above all, and through all, and in you all. You see, God is in you. Not only did you get placed in the body of Christ, God came to live in you as well. Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. You got Christ in you, the hope of glory. It says, But unto every one of us is given grace, according to the measure of the gift of Christ, wherefore he saith, saith when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He did this when he was buried for those three days and three nights. He went down there and preached to the spirits in prison, as it talks about in First Peter 3.19. And then he resurrected, and he took the Old Testament saints up with him. When he ascended, he left gifts for the church. It says in Ephesians 4, 10 through 12, He that descended is the same also that ascended, up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave some apostles, and some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers, for the per perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. We don't only learn from men like pastors and teachers we don't on, we don't only learn from men like this we study ourselves as well and then those men help with the perfecting of the saints and to edify us and it says in Ephesians 4:22 that you put off concerning the former conversation the old man which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust you see you have to put it off when you get saved, you have to put the old man off. That's your flesh. You see, what? if you're saved, you are two people. You have an old man on the outside and a new man on the inside. You need to put off the old man. Don't do what your flesh wants to do. It just gets you in trouble. You see, what the holiness crowd doesn't understand, they don't understand that you got an old man and a new man. They think you're all new. They think your flesh is saved. They think your your flesh can be sinlessly perfect. What they don't realize is when you got saved, your flesh did not get saved. You still got the same sinful flesh that you did before you were saved. For example, if you were addicted to pain pills and pornography and uh, alcohol and smoking pot and all this stuff before you were saved most likely that's the same stuff that your flesh is going to crave after you're saved. But the thing is now, you got the Holy Spirit inside of you that can help you get victory over those things. True victory. And as a safe person, you should not do just what your flesh wants to do. You put off the old man. It says in Ephesians 4, 23 and 24, And be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man. That's what you got when you got saved. Which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. You see? Created in righteousness and true holiness. That's what's holy about you is the new man. Your old man's not holy at all. 
this is the new creature in you, the, is the holiness about you. In 2 Corinthians 5, 17, it says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. The old man ain't new. You still have him. Not everything about you is new when you got saved. So the all things that are become new in 2 Corinthians 5, 17... That's that's talking about the inside. Can't be talking about the outside. You still got the old man on. So the old man ain't new. You still and you still have him. So you have to put off the old man daily. Paul says, I die daily. Paul says, I reckon myself dead. Paul said, O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? He, he said, I find that in my flesh dwelleth no good thing so that can't be the new creature it can't be part of the new creature your flesh is not the new creature why do you think that you need a new body at the rapture because that flesh is bad the old man is bad and you see when you get saved god just doesn't make you a robot and make you do good you still have a choice even after you're saved. You can put off the old man and let the new man lead the way, or you can keep the old man on and let the old man lead the way. He says in Ephesians 4.26, Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down on your wrath. You see, you need to get mad about some things, but don't be angry without a cause. In, my, in Matthew 5.22, it says, But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. So there are good reasons. There's a cause to get angry. Be ye angry and sin not. Don't go to bed angry. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath. And he says in verse 27, Neither give place to the devil. You see, if you give, if you give the devil an inch, then he'll become your ruler. He'll start being the ruler of your life if you give him an inch. Ephesians 4.28, Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, labor, working with his hands the thing which is good that he may have to give to him that needeth. This smacks this world in the face, this verse right here. You have men that don't want to work, but would rather steal for a living. You have men that don't want to work, but would rather hold a sign up and beg for your money. In a way, that's stealing because... They're just as able as you are to work. The, I mean, I'm not talking about everybody, but probably the majority of people out doing that can work just as good as you can. It says, Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good that he may have to give to him that needeth. You see, there are some people that do need your help. But then there are people that are just out stealing people's money. And that what they're saying is, uh, I'm lazy, so I'm going to let you work, and then you give me your money. They need to go to work so that they can give to people that really do need. It says in Ephesians 4.29, Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. So let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, and that could be a number of things. Cussing, dirty jokes, I mean unnecessary putting down of everybody around you all the time, correcting the Bible, complaining, striving about things. All that stuff is corrupt communication, and it doesn't edify anybody. In Ephesians 4.30 it says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. You see, I received the Holy Spirit in me the moment I got saved. And the moment I got saved, that same Holy Spirit baptized me into the body of Christ. That was the spirit baptism. It had nothing to do with water. He sealed me into the day of redemption. Nothing can break the seal. And that, that day of redemption is the rapture when I get my new body, that new body that I need because this body, this old man is corrupt. I have to, and I have to put off the old man but at the rapture when i get that new body this this old man is coming off permanently chapter five you got the husband and wife illustrate christ and the church 
In Ephesians 5, and 23, it says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. So when a woman doesn't submit to her husband, then she messes up the illustration. Because that's like the bride of Christ not submitting to Jesus Christ. When a woman is rebellious towards her husband, doesn't let him lead, that messes up the illustration. And it says, Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. So you say, well, that means he can be mean to me. Those are stupid arguments because is Jesus Christ mean to his bride? Does Jesus Christ take advantage of his bride? Are you a doormat to Jesus Christ? Obviously not. It says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. At the same time, when a man doesn't love his wife, he messes up the illustration. You see, Jesus loved the church and gave himself for it. A man has to give himself. He can't be selfish. He has to put God first and then the wife and children. He needs to be last. He needs to put himself dead last. Just like Jesus did. It was Jesus putting himself first when he died on the cross. Did he say, I'm not going through that pain and agony and taking the sin of the world and the wrath of God on me? He didn't. So, I, he, you know, the day that he knew he was down on the cross, did he sleep in and say, uh, I don't feel like it? No, he, he put others first. You need to put your wife first. You see, everything works out when both the husband and wife do what they're supposed to do. The, w w the the wife submits to her husband. The husband puts the wife first. The wife's taken care of. And that's the way how God wants it. And then he says in Ephesians 5.26, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. The word is what cleanses you. You see this, the, the world gets you dirty and puts stuff in your mind that shouldn't be there. The word gives you a good brainwash. He says in verse 27 that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. 1 Corinthians 7, 4, The wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband, and likewise also the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. If you have a wife, then you are one flesh with her, to be mean to her is like being mean to yourself because you're one now. It says in Ephesians 5.29, For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth it and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. Just like you're joined to your wife, the bride of Christ is one flesh with Jesus Christ. And it says in Ephesians 5.32, This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. And watch the church. The church is his body. It's a mystery how every safe person makes up the body of Christ. It's a mystery. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself. And the wife see that she reverence her husband. Now, chapter 6, you got instructions to children and fathers and servants and masters. And then it gets into the spiritual wickedness in high places and the whole armor of God. It says in Ephesians 6, 7, uh, With good will, doing service as to the Lord and not to men. You see, when you're at work or whatever you're doing, you do it as to the Lord, not to men. For example, don't slack off when the supervisor's not there because you remember, you're not doing the job for the supervisor. You're doing it for the Lord. It says in verse 8, Knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. You see, any good thing, if you're going in into a job and providing for your family, then you will receive something of the Lord for that. I mean, that's a command of God. It says in the Bible, If any provide not for his own, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. You know, it's it's a good work to the Lord to get up and go to work. 
and have a good testimony at work and be a good worker, that is working for the Lord as well, not just to keep yourself up and to keep your family up. You know, that's a testimony. That's that's like wit, uh, a way of witnessing in a way. You go to work, show people that you're a Christian, have your Bible with you, don't cuss, don't tell dirty jokes, have a good testimony and be a good worker. That's a witnessing tool right there. In Ephesians 6, 9, And ye masters, do the same things unto them for bearing threatening, knowing that your master also is in heaven, neither is their respective persons with him. Even the master on earth has a master in heaven. Even the supervisor, any authority figure, the president, the kings, they got a master in heaven. Remember your master in heaven. But now Paul is going to lay out your armor. He's going to talk about your armor. The armor is for someone who meets the enemy face to face. Just like an infantryman or something. It says in Ephesians 6, 11, Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of, dark, of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Our real enemy isn't flesh and blood, but actually the spirits who lead that flesh and blood. The, the spiritual wickedness gets in the flesh and blood and many times, times causes them to, to do just things that the average person isn't going to do. That's who your real enemy is. The darkness of this world will come at you in a spiritual sense and put thoughts in your mind and attack you that way. But they also come at you physically by inhabiting the physical people of this world to cause you trouble, to make the world a horrible place around you. Ephesians six thirteen and 14, Wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness. So what's that loins girt about with truth? If you're a Bible-believing Christian, then you are the only one who knows where to find absolute truth. Bible-believing Christians are the only people in this world that know where to find absolute truth. I'm not saying that there's not truth in other things. You know, some people on the news, they have some truth. Some people that aren't saved can write books with truth in it. You know, there's... There can be a little bit of truth in anything. But a Bible-believing Christian is the only set of people that know where to find absolute truth because the only absolute truth is in the Scriptures. And there's Christians that aren't Bible believers. They don't believe that there's a book on this planet that's completely true from cover to cover. They believe there's errors in it. But a Bible-believing Christian knows where to find absolute truth. The news networks don't have absolute truth. They just got a little bit of truth every now and then. The new Bibles don't have absolute truth from cover to cover because, I mean, they, they've changed it. The denominations don't have it. I mean, they've got some truth, but they don't have absolute truth. Your grandma doesn't have it, but you have a book that has it. Your grandma may have a book that has it, when everything is a rumor, a false flag, a conspiracy, a fake news article, and everything else, I don't have to worry about that because I have the truth in my hand. And I can get truth from other places outside of the Bible. But when it comes down to it, I have to filter everything through the Bible to find out if that is actually the truth or not. So I'm going to keep my loins girt about with truth. I girt myself about with that truth. And that's what's going to help me stand against the wiles of the devil. The next thing, breastplate of righteousness. The more righteous you live, the more armored up you're going to become. Doing the bad boy thing and the bad girl thing, you think that makes you tougher. That makes you weaker, actually. You think the tougher you look and the badder you act, that makes you tougher. It actually makes you weaker. It makes you more vulnerable to the devil's attacks. 
you see all these things that bad boys do, you know, like smoking, they think that makes them look tough, you know, going around getting with all types of different girls, they think that makes them look cool. All this stuff actually makes you weaker. I mean, some of the weakest people that I work with, they're constantly having to go smoke break. They can't stay working with me because they're like, oh, I got to go smoke. I got to do this. I got to do that. What does constant fornication cause people? STDs. Well, that doesn't make you stronger. I've worked with alcoholics. They're constantly profusely sweating and constantly having to run to the bathroom because they drank so much the previous day. Did that make them stronger or weaker? It made them weaker. All these things that you do that aren't righteous are making you weak. You're more vulnerable to his attacks. If you're going to put on the breastplate of righteousness, then every day you're getting up. You're putting off that old man that we talked about, and you're letting that new man lead the way. You're choosing to serve God. And when you serve the devil, you take off the breastplate of righteousness. Ephesians 6.15, it says, and, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. So the preparation of the gospel. If you have this armor on, then you have prepared yourself to preach the gospel at any second. You have the verses marked in your Bible. Better yet, you got them memorized. You know them through and through. You're ready to tell a man he's a sinner, he needs a Savior, and ready to tell him what the Savior did for him so that he can be saved and put on the whole armor of God. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, the shield of faith. Do you realize how much stronger and braver and ready for war you are when you have faith? When you got the shield of faith. When you have faith that the Bible is always right, it's your shield. When you have faith that God is real even though you can't see him, you've got a shield. When you have faith, you got your shield up. And it says, and take the helmet of salvation. The helmet of salvation, you see the difference between Bible believers and other people is that you know you have salvation. If you're staying in the book and you're a Bible believer, then you know that you are you got salvation. You know that even if you fall or, and die, you fall in the arms of Jesus Christ. Salvation is a helmet. You see, when you play football, you're a lot more confident with the helmet on than you are without one. You know, if you get whacked up the head or your head headbutts somebody else, you know it's not going to hurt. In the Christian life, you're more confident with the helmet of salvation on. Because you know you're safe and you know you're saved. And when the devil comes at you and says, well, you don't have salvation. You got the helmet of salvation on. You understand that you're saved. Next, the sword of the Spirit. The world doesn't understand the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. They don't understand why I take the Bible with me everywhere I go. I take it to work. I take it to the doctor. I take it when I'm driving around. I take it when I know my wife is going to be in the store for a couple hours and then I got a that gives me a extra time to study in the car if she's gone for two hours oh well it doesn't bother me that gives me two hours to study in the car as long as the kids don't go crazy you know but people wonder why why do you carry that around everywhere well you carry a gun on your waist you see it's my sword you carry a gun on your waist I carry my sword with me I carry my bible with me at work I'm packing several of them. I got my big one in my lunchbox. I got one in my locker. I got a little one in my freezer jacket. They say, well, you just, you, you don't worship God. You worship a book. I, when people say that, I don't say nothing, but I'm like, oh, please. Think about it like this. If you couldn't see your wife and all you could do is receive letters from her every day, if you stay reading those letters and talking about those letters and If you stay reading those letters, talking about those letters, does that mean you're just in love with those letters, those pieces of paper, or in love with the person that wrote those words on those pieces of paper? Obviously, you're in love with the person that wrote them. When your main focus is, focus is on the Bible, on the Scriptures, you're not just focused on those, those, uh, on those pieces of paper you're focused on the one who wrote those words on that piece of paper 
So don't give me this junk about, well, you just worship the Bible. That doesn't make any sense to me. I worship the person who wrote the Bible, and he thought very highly of those words. When people say stuff like that, that comes from someone who doesn't understand what they're even talking about. In Ephesians 6, 18, it says, Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. You've got the sword of the Spirit, and that is how God talks to you. You also need prayer, and that's how you talk to God.